great to be with you again. We have some uh, very interesting scripture passages to be looking at today. Uh, maybe you've noticed that the uh, gospel readings during these Sundays after Pentecost go through the uh, gospel of Matthew chapter by chapter. And the first reading typically relates to some of the same themes as the gospel lesson. And then the second reading goes through uh, one of the letters in the New Testament so that does not relate to either the first reading or the gospel, but instead the uh, second readings of the previous and following week. First passage we're going to be looking at is the uh, from uh, the book of Jonah in the Old Testament. And this is a very similar theme to uh, the Jonah's uh, attitude was very similar to those that had worked all day in the vineyard in our gospel reading. I mentioned on the study sheet that Jonah had two real problems. He had a problem with obedience, and he also had a real major problem with compassion. God had told him to go northeast up to the city of Nineveh, the capital of Assyria, which was the great threat to Israel at the time. God, uh, Jonah did not want to go there because he did not want to spread the message of God's love to Nineveh in case it would repent. And so instead of going northeast, Jonah went west. It, said he, it says that he set out to flee to Tarshish, which is present-day Spain, from the presence of the Lord. He wanted to get as far, as he went, far away from God as he could, going in the opposite direction. I think of uh, the difference between FM and Sirius XM. I like the way with Sirius XM I can have radio coverage all the way across the desert. And I can have cell phone coverage except maybe going through certain mountain passes and so on. It's nice to have that coverage. That is a source of comfort. Uh, Psalm 139 says, Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? Most of us might be comforted by the fact that uh, uh, no matter where we are, God's presence is there with us. Well, Jonah was frustrated by that because he wanted to get away from God. And so I asked the question, was there a time in your life when you tried to do the same, get away from God? Jonah says he went down to Joppa, the port city, and found a ship going to Tarshish, paid his fare, and went on board. When have I had to pay the price of my trying to flee from God, trying to get away from him, hoping if I got far enough away, the radio signal from God would be weak enough where I could escape him. Another thing about uh, Jonah is that uh, here we have a raging storm, a giant fish, a growing plant, and a gnawing worm. Shows that God will use whatever it takes in order to get our attention. What has God used to get your attention? Now the sailors come across much better than Jonah. Jonah didn't care about the city of Nineveh. He didn't want it to know God's uh, 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 blessings. And the sailors come across much better. They rode hard trying to, trying to save the ship so they wouldn't have to toss Jonah overboard. It is a shame when people who do not claim to be followers of Jesus come across better and act better than those who do. Now Jonah was bothered the fact that God would give his grace to Nineveh. And so has there been a time when you were bothered by whom God gave his grace to? And the same theme will come up now in our gospel reading. Psalm 145, just want to look at a couple verses. Uh, verse 4, One generation shall laud your works to another and to declare your mighty acts. I make the comment that it is absolutely imperative that each generation pass on the faith to the next generation. It's been said that the Christian faith is always only just one generation away from extinction. It's absolutely important that the faith be passed on. It reminds me of 2 Timothy 2.2. Paul says to his young friend Timothy, what you have heard from me through many witnesses and trust of faithful people who will be able to teach others as well. Here we see four generations of believers, from Paul to Timothy to faithful people to others as well. It is absolutely important that the faith be passed on. In contrast, you have the situation after Moses, the situation after Joshua. 
During the time of the leadership of Moses, it mentions that Joshua was the servant of Moses. Joshua learned how to be the leader, and so there was a good transition from Moses to Joshua. That was successful. But then Joshua is the leader, and there is this tragic statement at the beginning, the end of Joshua and the beginning of the book of Judges, which comes next. It says that Israel served God all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who lived, uh, served with Joshua, but then all of them died off. Eventually that's going to happen. And there arose a whole new generation who did not know the Lord and the mighty things that he had done. It is absolutely imp imperative that one generation lauds your works and declares your mighty acts to the next generation. And then verse 8, the Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. How often have we seen that description of God in the Psalms? Gracious, giving us more than we deserve. Merciful, not giving us what we deserve. Slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Then, let's take a brief look at the first uh, chapter of Paul's letter to the Philippians. This is really his most joyful epistle. It is filled with just all sorts of positive, good, uplifting statements. Paul had a wonderful relationship with this church in northern Greece here at Philippi. And he starts off, now uh, the lesson starts off with verse 21, for me to live is uh, Christ and to die is gain, but I wanted to give you a little bit of a context for that verse. Paul says in verse 12, I want you to know that what has happened to me has actually helped to spread the gospel. Paul says in this letter and in several of his letters that we need to rejoice in all things and be thankful in all circumstances. And here he gives his life as an example of that. He says, there are so many things about my present situation. He's in prison when he writes it. And yet he says that my situation has not turned uh, out for the bad, but instead what has happened has actually helped me spread the gospel. How can we have a positive attitude towards all of the things that we are facing as well in life today? He mentions four things. First, he says, it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to everyone else that my imprisonment is for Christ. People might think that you're a captive in prison. That's worse than any quarantine that we are having to deal with. You are a captive. You simply cannot share Christ. Well, Paul says, being chained to a, chained to a Roman soldier, I actually have a captive audience. And so all of the soldiers that are here in the prison working have heard about Jesus. And so the whole imperial guard knows about Jesus. I've been making the most of every situation and blooming where I am planted. And then he says in verse 14, other Christians have been made more confident in the Lord by my imprisonment. And so my example has been a source of encouragement to others. And then he says in verse 18, I know that there are those that are using this, op this uh, my imprisonment as an opportunity to badmouth me and to work against me, and they are proclaiming Christ out of envy, but at least they're proclaiming Christ, and I will give, uh, uh, I will give thanks for that. And then in verse 21, he says, for me to live as Christ and to die as gain. Uh, and uh, he knew that the possibility of his death was, uh, was imminent, not knowing when that might come. But he says, you know, if I'm able to stay alive, I can serve Jesus. If I die, I go to, I go to be with Jesus. Either way, it's okay. Living in Christ is Christ and dying is gain. You see, Paul was a man who knew that he could not lose. And so I asked the question, what would you be willing to do? What would you be willing to try if you knew that you could not lose. Wonderful attitude that he has. And then in verse 27, he says, live your life in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ so that, um, so that I will know that you are in no way intimidated by your opponents. Are you living your life in a way that is worthy of the gospel? If you are not, what needs to change? And then I ask the question, who intimidates you? And what could you do about it? You know, every one of us has someone that just kind of spooks us. The one that intimidates you. What is it about that person that intimidates you? 
and what could you do about it? And now let's turn to the gospel reading. That's what I wanted to uh, spend a little more time on today. Now, how often have you thought or said, it's not fair? The way that life is treating me, what, how little I am getting for how much I am doing, is just simply not fair. Someone sent me a video yesterday of a little girl who was just lamenting the shutdown. Everything was in life was ruined. The playground at McDonald's was closed. It's boring waiting in your car for food. It's just not fair. Everything is wrong. How often have you shouted or lamented, it's just not fair? Well, our gospel reading for this coming Sunday strikes at our sense of what is and is not fair. And as we go through the story, it seems that it is not fair. And we wonder, well, why would Jesus tell a story like this one? That the story starts off by saying that there was a landowner that went out early in the morning in order to hire laborers for his vineyard. And this is the way in which it works in many parts of the world today, where there are day laborers that don't have a regular job. And so they go to a place where uh, people go looking for laborers, for people to work for the day. And often those are unskilled or less skilled persons who go from job to job, and many of their jobs only last for one day. And so Jesus tells us that the landowner agreed with the people that were there early in the morning for the usual daily wage. Other translation says that it was a denarius, which is the pay for a Roman soldier for the day. Now for unskilled or less skilled persons, getting a denarius for a day's work was actually fairly generous. And so they probably agreed quite eagerly and happily for that wage. Now this particular landowner's property must have been quite large, a huge vineyard, and it was harvest time. And he needed some more workers to get the job done, and so he goes out again at 9 o'clock, at noon, and at 3 o'clock, and hires the people that are there. And concerning those um, uh, who he hired at 9 o'clock, he said, I will pay you whatever is right. Notice this particular group, he did not uh, negotiate a particular specific wage, but they must have trusted him that he would be fair. And then the description of those that he hired at 5 o'clock, it says that they were standing around. I don't think that means that they were lazy, it's just that no one else had hired for them for the day. And that reminds me of people that we need to pray for who are unemployed, have lost their jobs, are not able to find work during these days of the pandemic. Now, in most vineyards, work would be winding down well by 5 o'clock. And so anybody that had not been hired by 5 o'clock probably had given hope of being hired for that day. But on this particular day, it was different. And it was different because of the generosity of the landowner. You see, this was a landowner who cared not only about his grapes and his vineyard, but he also cared much about the workers. And so we see in this parable there are three groups of workers. Those that were hired early and first, with whom the landowner entered into negotiated negotiation for a specific wage <coughs> for the day, which was for unskilled or less skilled persons actually fairly generous. Those hired later with whom there was not a specific amount agreed upon, but they trusted the landowner. And those hired very late, who probably had already given up hope of being able to earn anything that day. Now Jesus tells us that when the evening came, those hired last were paid first. And they, much to their surprise, were paid a full day's wage, a denarius. And so naturally, those who were hired first and had worked all day, when they came to be paid, they figured that they were going to get more, much more, than what had been the original agreement. But they also received what had been negotiated for the full, normal, us usual one day's wage. And so those who had worked the whole day began to complain. And you can understand their complaining. Working in the vineyard is very hard work, and in harvest time, it, temperatures can reach well over 100 degrees, as they do here in Arizona. It's so nice to have it cooler than it was, but harvest time in a vineyard, it was hot. 
They had been out in the hot sun all day with very few uh, breaks. And so you can sympathize with these full day workers. We can understand their complaining. Originally, they had been very happy about being hired and being offered a denarius for the uh, full day work. But soon they realized that they were receiving the pay, the same pay as, the only, as those that had worked for only an hour. And they began to complain. And so the landowner addresses one of them, probably the leader of this angry group. Friend, he begins with. Now the word for friend here is not a friend as of in a close acquaintance, but instead kind of a casual acquaintance. Landowner says, friend, I'm doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual day's wage? You were happy about it at the time. And so take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last what I gave to the first, and, um, and am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? And th this, is, this shows us that grace can have a real edge to it. Can we be envious because God is generous? It's challenging, and it even can be quite disturbing. The issue of whom God will give his grace to can be upsetting to us, just like it was upsetting for Jonah, who did not want God's grace to go to the people of Nineveh. And so what is the story telling us? <clears throat> is the story merely telling us that there are going to be people who are going to be saved later than us, and we simply have to accept the fact that they're going to get into the same heaven as us, even though they were on far fewer church committees and even though they did far less good Christian work than we did. Is that all it is saying? I believe that there is more in this story, more instruction and more information about grace, of what God wants us to learn about his grace. First, grace is a free gift from God. You see, the problem in the story is not a cruel and mean landowner, but instead the scandal of the generous farmer. Now, most of us would probably identify with the workers that put in a full day's work. We think of ourselves as doing, or at least earlier in our lives, having done a lot for God. And so the behavior of the landowner baffles us. It bothers us that God gives gifts rather than distributes wages. The problem is that if it's a, if it's a wage that we want from God, if we want to be compensated according to what we actually deserve, the Bible makes it very clear what the wage would be. Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. But if you want something better and different from that, the second half of the verse tells us what that is. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You see, for all of us, grace is a free gift. Now, I used to have a neighbor where every time I saw him, I would ask him, how are you doing? How is it for you? And he would always answer, <clears throat> I am better than I deserve. And one time he had his young grandson with him, and I asked his young grandson how he was doing. And my neighbor told his young grandson to answer, tell him, better than I deserve. Well, grace is our receiving from God far better than we deserve. Second, grace keeps us from looking down on ourselves. Think for a moment about those that had not been hired until 5 o'clock. They had been waiting around all day while all the other workers were chosen. And by 4.30 in the afternoon, they probably figured that they were not going to earn anything that day. And so they might not have any money to be able to buy food for dinner that night. And usually it was the best and the strongest who were chosen first, kind of like the way in which t children and young people t pick teams for a sport. They always pick the best players first, and then somebody at the end, some team has to take the one that really isn't good at all. And so these five o'clock workers, they were the leftovers. Maybe they were the weakest or the oldest or the least skilled. If someone has other choices, who in the world would ever hire them? And you know, you and I are a lot like those five o'clock workers. 
But when you think about it, why would God choose us? What do we have to offer to the Lord? God does not need our intellect, our skills, our energy, our money, our good works, or our good looks in order for his kingdom to come. But here in this story, we see God's passion and compassion and concern, even for those that are forgotten and overlooked. Our hope and confidence and value and joy are not based upon us, but upon the grace that has been given to us and the one who has chosen us. And then third, grace makes us equal to everybody else. The complaint of the all-day workers was, you have made them, the five o'clock workers, equal to us. They wanted to be superior. They wanted to get more. And so they grumbled. And the word, the verb tense for grumbled is not that they grumbled just once, but instead that they kept ungrumbling. They were not saying, you have put us on a par with the latecomers. Rather, they were complaining, you have put the latecomers on par with us. They were envious because they thought they deserved more. You know, there's something in each one of us that makes us wish that God would grade on a curve because we think that we should get an A while these other people should get a D minus. Notice the tragic sequence of events that took place in the hearts of the workers. First, they started comparing and then coveting and then complaining and then criticizing. And if you find yourself coveting, complaining, and criticizing, maybe we need to stop comparing ourselves to other people. In the economy of God's grace, we all are equal. And so grace is a free gift from God. Grace keeps us from looking down on ourselves. Grace makes us equal to everybody else. And then fourth, grace gives us all a new start. Jesus ends the parable by saying, and so the last will be first, and the first will be last. Jesus is saying in the kingdom of God, first and last don't matter anymore. Grace is not about who finishes first, nor is it about who finishes last. Grace is not about keeping score. Rather, grace is a chance at a do-over, a fresh start whenever you need it. And so do you need a fresh start today? Do you need a new beginning today? Grace says that you can have a fresh start and a new beginning. Even though, unfortunately, there still are three and a half more months for the, for the year 2020, and we're not sure how much better 2021 is going to be until well into the year, if you, according to the experts. Still, you can have a new beginning today. It's really simple. The more you feel your need for grace, the better position you're in to receive grace. And so hold out your empty hands and ask God for his grace. He will not turn you away. You know, when we all get to heaven, there's going to be no contest in terms of who is more or most or less or least deserving of God's grace. Because none of us is deserving of God's grace. When we look at back on what we have done and where we have come from, and when we remember that Jesus, Jesus reached out to us and chose us when everyone else overlooked us and ignored us and forgot, and forgot about us when we were like the five o'clock workers, when we see Jesus who loves us and who gave himself for us, as somebody once said, the only contest in heaven is going to be who can sing the loudest, not the best, but the loudest. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found, was blind, but now I see. And let's pray. Our Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for the marvelous wonder of your grace. And because of your grace, we do not need to look down on ourselves, even though we may be like the forgotten, not chosen until five o'clock workers. And because of your grace, we know we belong to you. We know that we have forgiveness and, and hope and strength and joy. 
We pray that we will not be like Jonah and say, well, I want this good gift for me, but I sure don't want it for these certain other people. We also pray that we will have the attitude of the Apostle Paul. For us, living will be Christ and dying would be gain. And so knowing that no matter what happens to us, we can serve you and we belong to you. We pray for that kind of confidence so we will in, take on the challenges that you would have for us, knowing that as your people, we are winners we cannot lose. And in Jesus, your name we pray. Amen.